Okay, so the next portion of the chapter introduces us to two terms, elastic and inelastic. We'll pretty much think of these as elastic and everything else. Now, one thing we want to be aware of is one of the reasons why chapter 8 is so important to physics is because we have about a century's worth of knowledge about the atomic structure of different elements and how a single atom is actually laid out, the idea that there's this central high-mass nucleus and then electrons orbiting around that. All of that information, as we built up our understanding of atomic physics, all of that information came from smashing things together and having them have collisions, and in most cases, elastic collisions. So let's introduce these terms from the textbook. Elastic collisions are ones where we have the same amount of kinetic energy at the start of the problem that we do at the end of the problem. And so no kinetic energy is lost to heat. No energy is lost out of the system. And so if we think of rubber bouncy balls, they bounce very high, not necessarily right back up to where they started, but they get close. Perfect super balls would have elastic collisions. If we could think of the most rubbery, um, bouncy material that we could think of. Inelastic collisions are everything else, and we won't really use the word inelastic so often because it really is just all of the things that aren't elastic. In all of these not elastic situations, momentum is conserved because that's true for all types of collisions, but kinetic energy is not. Things might stick together, like our or original example 8a here. They might lose energy as they bounce apart. There's a lot of in-between possibilities that are all not elastic. So if we think about an elastic collision, elastic collisions conserve kinetic energy, which means the same amount of kinetic energy you have before you hit an object is going to be the same amount of energy you have at the end if that object, like a wall, doesn't move at all. So this collision shown here would be elastic if the incoming velocity and the outgoing velocity are the same amount, or the incoming speed is equal to the outgoing speed. If we were to do problem solving with elastic collisions, we would be able to solve for two separate unknowns, the final velocity of the first object and the final velocity of the second object. It would be possible if we had two equations, and if we know that the kinetic energy is conserved, then we can write down this bottom equation here. There are v squared terms, and the other equation doesn't have these, and we could go through this, but it would be very algebra intensive. And while it is within while it is within our um, toolkit, it doesn't add a lot of physics to do these kinds of problems um, as much as it just adds a bunch of math, um, needlessly complicated. And so instead, there is a simpler equation that we can use and we can do problem solving with that are um, that is a result that works for one-dimensional collisions which is fine, that's the um, portion of the chapter that we're currently in, we may or may not have chance to post the digital handout showing um, a fully worked problem using the hard way and a fully worked problem showing this easier way. We can, however, think about some key situations using this brand new equation that we've written down. So this equation, V1 initial minus V2 initial, equals V2 final minus V1 final. This is used for elastic collisions. So let's say, for example, that we're imagining serving a tennis ball. So the tennis ball is not coming towards our racket very quickly. We kind of throw it and then we hit it when it's um, at that maximum height, so it's at rest briefly. We could also think about having a golf ball on a tee and then we swing the um, golf club into it. In both cases, the velocity of the little mass, the ball, is zero, and the big mass is moving at some initial speed. Now, if we think about this situation, and let's get out the whiteboard, if we think about this situation where the big mass continues to move, 
So if we think of the idea of follow through, when we first hit the tennis ball, we just have the racket keep going, we keep pushing it. Or the golf club, if we keep going with the um, golf club and it doesn't slow down, then for the big mass, we'll say that the initial velocity is equal to the final velocity. So that's a simplification, certainly. But it's one that we can kind of understand if we think about follow through. For the little mass, the ball, the initial velocity is zero. We're talking about specific circumstances where we either have the golf ball resting on a tee or the tennis ball that's been thrown into the air to serve and is momentarily at rest. If we use our brand new equation, and I'm going to um, write this down where in both of these situations with the big mass and the small mass, I'm just going to say that that velocity is um, V of the big mass. So V big. Okay. Oh, and this black marker is really gray, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to keep using it. So if we look at this situation where we have V1 initial minus V2 initial equals V2 final minus V1 final, note how the 1 and the 2 switch because if something's coming in and then bouncing away, it has to switch directions. So we have the big velocity minus zero equals the ball's velocity, the one that we're, um, or the little mass, minus that big mass velocity. So all I'm doing is plugging in the fact that these two, V1 initial and V1 final, are both the big mass, and that the ball originally started moving at, or did not start moving, it started with a zero velocity. So if we want to know the velocity of the ball, we just add V big to both sides. And what we end up with is 2V of the big mass is the, ma the sorry, 2 times the velocity of the big mass is the velocity of the ball, the little mass with our assumptions. So our assumptions are that the um, big object didn't slow down, that it kept going, and that the little object was starting at rest, and the last key um, assumption here is that this is only true if we have an elastic collision, if, if our object is perfectly bouncy. And what we will start to talk about soon is that real situations are typically not elastic collisions at the large scales. Certainly our, um, our atomic collisions, the ones that I mentioned briefly at the start of this um, portion, are um, elastic collisions. But at large scales, we typically don't have real elastic collisions. But what this tells us is the maximum possible speed that one of these um, situations can have, the maximum speed that tennis can go is twice what you swing with, and the maximum speed at which that golf ball can um, go off the tee is twice what you swing with. And often it's less than that for various reasons of these um, um, assumptions that we went into. So let's think about that then for baseball. Okay, Baseballs are not known to be particularly bouncy. If we assume that we have a perfectly bouncy, rubbery Super Bowl baseball, we want to think about what those kinds of situations would look like. So we've gone to our baseball game, and maybe it's the eighth or ninth inning, and everyone's kind of tired. The baseball is thrown at 20 meters per second. Okay, that's about 45 miles an hour. I could probably throw that fast. It's pretty slow for major league pitchers. And the batter doesn't try all that hard, and he swings with 15 meters per second at the baseball. Okay? 
So let's go through this same kind of situation with our um, equation here of what would happen if, two key things, if the batter follows through. So for the bat, V1 initial is equal to V2, oh sorry, V1 initial is equal to V1 final, and both of those are going to be equal to positive 15 meters per second. It's moving to the right. And for the ball, the initial speed of the ball is negative 20 meters per second because it is moving to the left. So, so far we have this, and we have our equation that we introduced on the previous slides for elastic collisions. If we are imagining that this is an elastic collision, then we're going to use this equation that I've put in a box here. And so we plug in our numbers. We have positive 15 minus negative 20 equals the unknown final ball um, speed or velocity minus positive 15. So we can add 15 to both sides to get v-ball by itself. And what we will get is that we get 50, positive 50 meters per second for that baseball. So without anyone trying all that hard, so the pitcher doesn't try that hard, the batter doesn't try that hard, if we were using a super ball, a super bouncy baseball, it would leave the um, plate going at over 110 miles an hour. And so this is not an elastic collision. And if we want to handle real situations like a baseball and a bat, we can't assume that things are going to be perfectly elastic, but we also can't assume the other extreme, perfectly inelastic, where they're stuck together. There is a way for us to handle the in-between situations. We can consider the coefficient of restitution. So this phrase, coefficient of restitution, is a way for us to be able to think about the in-between situations. It's not perfectly elastic, but it's also not going to stick together. So the coefficient of restitution is called C, where it's kind of like a rubberiness um, value between 0 and 1. 0 is where nothing is, is bouncy at all. The objects stick together. If we imagine holding a um, handful of mud, we drop it onto the table, it goes splat, and it sticks. It doesn't bounce. That would be C equals 0. If we have a perfectly um, rubbery super ball, we drop it from the table, it bounces, and it comes right back up to our hand. It didn't lose any energy whatsoever. And that would be a C value of 1. There's lots of in-between here, but that's the main idea. The simplest way that we can measure this is to throw an object against a wall or floor and measure the speed before and after the collision. So in this particular simple setup, the ball is heading downwards at 20 meters per second. It bounces back up at 10 meters per second. The outgoing speed is 10. The incoming speed is 20. And so the C value is 10 divided by 20, or 1 half, 0.5. Basically, right in between uh, perfectly elastic and completely sticking together. And what we'll find is that baseballs tend to be about in that halfway in between place. We can think of another example and compare it to this list of um, recorded coefficients of restitution, where instead of having the floor that doesn't move, we can imagine for the before the collision, the incoming speed, the baseball is heading at 100 kilometers, to, to, <laughs> 100 kilometers per hour toward home plate, and the bat is heading 100 kilometers per hour towards the pitcher. And so these things are coming together at 200 kilometers per hour. And then when the batter follows through and continues to move at 100 kilometers per hour, now the ball is moving at 210 kilometers per hour, where they're moving away from each other by only 110 kilometers per hour, since they're both moving in the same direction. So the outgoing speed, 110, 
divided by the incoming speed 200 would give us a value of 0 0.55 for this baseball. And if we look at this table of recorded values, baseballs do tend to have coefficients of restitution between 0.55 and 0.57. Now this list here shows us a couple of things. First of all, there is a dependence on the impact speed for the way that coefficient of restitution actually works. And for all of these different numbers, if we look at them, the ones that are kind of known to be bouncy, ping pong balls bounce better than squash balls do. The things that are known to be bouncy have a higher number, and the things that aren't intended to really bounce that much, baseballs aren't intended to be bouncy, they have a smaller number. So if you have a couple of these um, at home, what I would recommend is find them, drop them from the same height, and see which one bounces up um, to a higher height. Because that's the one that's keeping more of its energy, it will have a higher coefficient of restitution. And then you can do a quick little um, at-home comparison test for some of these more common um, sporting equipment. The last thing to note here is what it means then for us to, to look at a collision as it's happening and not know any of the final velocities, there are a couple of situations that are possible. If we look at these two masses, we have initial velocities, we have their masses, we can solve this problem if we're told the objects stick together. That was the very first example we did in chapter 8. That is doable for us. If this is an elastic collision, this would be possible. We aren't practicing this problem type, so we won't be asking about it quantitatively, but it would be possible for us to solve this if we're told it's an elastic collision. We'd have two equations and two unknowns, and we'd solve it. But with the coefficient of restitution as well, we can now handle any of the in-between points too. We just have to be told that these objects have a coefficient of restitution of 0.4 or 0.6. In any of those situations, we need the conservation of momentum equation. Any collision, no matter the type, needs the conservation of momentum equation. And we could use this kind of slightly modified version of the elastic collision problem with the coefficient of restitution C. Our um, toolkit can handle real world circumstances as long as we know something about the materials. Are they made of rubber? Are they made of wood? How bouncy, basically, are they? And so that brings us to the end of this lecture video. The last, last portion of the lecture gets into the collisions of point masses in two dimensions. And then to finish up the chapter, it will also talk very briefly about rockets. Um, and then you can tell your friends that you are, in fact, learning rocket science in class. I'll see you in the next one.